Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this very special event in the life of the law school. Today you will hear the 100th lecture in the University of Georgia School of Law's distinguished John A. Sibley Lecture Series. The series is named in honor of a 1911 graduate of law school, John Adam Sibley. Mr. Sibley's service to the law school and to the state of Georgia spanned almost 80 years. And when he passed away in 1986, at the age of 98, he left a legacy of success in corporate law, banking, and public service. Notably, in 1960, Mr. Sibley served as chairman of the Georgia General Assembly's Committee on Schools. And in that role, he laid the groundwork for a largely peaceful transition to racially integrated public schools in our state. He's often referred to as the man who saved public education in Georgia. He also played a key role in fundraising for Hirsch Hall, which is the building that you are sitting in today. The Sibley Lecture Series is founded by the Charles Lordens Foundation of Atlanta, and our school is grateful to the Lordens Foundation for their generous support of this series. It allows us to bring to our law, schools, law school outstanding scholars each year and promote the intellectual exchange of ideas. Since 1964, the Sibley Lecture Series has brought to our law school a former president of the United States, and such legal luminaries as Harry Blackman, Tom Clark, Antonin Scalia, Earl Warren, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Charles Allen Wright, Roger Traynor, H.L. Hart, Frank M. Johnson, Richard Posner, I could go on and on. This is a lecture series that has done much to enrich the academic environment of our law school, and today's speaker carries on that outstanding tradition of excellence that the Sibley Lecture Series has come to represent. And I thank you for being here today to help us celebrate this important milestone in the life of the series. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Associate Professor J. Randy Beck, who will introduce our guest speaker. Professor Beck graduated first in his class from SMU's law school. He is a former law clerk to Justice Anthony Kennedy of the U.S. Supreme Court and to Judge uh, Patrick Higginbotham of the Fifth Circuit. Uh, he teaches property, constitutional law, trust in estates, and Christian perspectives on legal thought. Please join me in welcoming Professor Beck. And I have the pleasure of introducing our fall 2005 Sibley lecturer. Professor Akil Reed Amar is the South Made professor at the Yale Law School. He graduated from Yale College reportedly with a 4.0 grade point average uh, and then attended the Yale Law School. Uh, after law school, he became a clerk for Judge Stephen Breyer, then on the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, now on the Supreme Court. Professor Amar returned to his alma mater following his clerkship, where he became one of the country's leading constitutional scholars. One biography I read indicated that he was the second youngest person to be tenured and given a chair in the history of the Yale Law School. He's published several books, including The Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction, and most recently, America's Constitution, a biography, from which I understand the material for today's lecture is drawn. Professor Amar has placed articles in numerous prominent law reviews. He's written a large number of columns on constitutional issues for the popular press. Uh, he's one of four co-authors of an extremely popular constitutional law textbook. Professor Sandy Levinson, who some of you remember, uh, will, delivered last spring's Sibley Lecture, is another of the co-authors on that textbook. Uh, the thing I really appreciate about Professor Amar's scholarship is his ability to use the conventional tools of constitutional analysis, text, history, and structure to show that the conventional conclusions about the Constitution are often wrong. When I was preparing for this introduction, I read a short piece he had written a few years ago about the Second Amendment, uh, which deals with the right to keep and bear arms. In the course of a few paragraphs, he explained the unusual wording of the amendment in a way that was very convincing and that completely undermined the constitutional analyses of both the National Rifle Association and their gun control opponents. Uh, so I don't expect him to run for office anytime soon, <laughs> but fortunately he's got tenure. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Labor Pains in America's New Birth of Freedom, How the Reconstruction Amendments Were Enacted 
Please join me in welcoming our Sibley lecturer, Professor Akil Reed Amar. Thank you so much. It is such a, a, a privilege and an honor to, to stand at this podium where so many, of, so many distinguished people have stood before me. Um, and uh, it's also a real pleasure to be down here. Uh, I get a chance to reconnect with old friends like my law school classmate and dear friend Dan Bedansky, to make new friends like, like Dean White, uh, who graciously had us out to her house yesterday uh, evening, um, to uh, meet some students, both formally and informally. Um, in the library, bumped into um, uh, a student, had a wonderful chat, just w strolling around the campus, went to lunch with a few students. And um, frankly, just to walk around this magnificent, extraordinary campus of yours. Um, I, uh, so if you invite me back, I'll come. Uh, thanks for having me. From 1864 through 1870, Americans of all sorts, women and men, blacks and whites, civilians and soldiers, Easterners and Westerners, ex-blues and ex-grays, engaged in a massive democratic struggle over the meaning of democracy itself. The result, breaking more than a half century of constitutional silence, was a trilogy of constitutional amendments. First, in 1865, the 13th Amendment ended slavery forever. Then came the 14th Amendment, proposed in 1866 and ratified in 1868, making all persons born in America, blacks no less than whites, women no less than men, full and equal citizens, and pledging to protect all fundamental civil rights against state and federal encroachment. But this package of civil rights purposely omitted the political right to vote and kindred political rights to hold office and serve on juries. Hence the need for yet another amendment, the 15th, proposed in 1869 and ratified the next year, guaranteeing black men precisely these political rights. From a modern perspective, this trilogy might seem to form an indivisible and inevitable post-war ensemble. But to Americans living through this tumultuous time, each amendment arose in its own unique historical moment, each raised its own set of issues, and in each amendment battle, neither side could know whether additional battles would follow. Let us then begin by pondering the first of this grand trilogy, the Abolition Amendment. That's the 13th. <clears throat> Though the Constitution of 1787-88 did not abolish slavery, it would be nice to think that the Founding Fathers designed a document whose arc would inexorably bend toward freedom and equality. Alas, the facts do not bear out this comforting thought. True, many framers piously hoped that one day slavery would disappear, yet they did little to, to hasten or guarantee that day, even when doing so might have been relatively painless, say, by constitutionally excluding slavery from all future Western territories. In fact, the Constitution's basic structure tilted the long-run game against the forces of freedom. For every slave bought or bred, the slaveocracy's clout in Congress and the Electoral College would increase thanks to the three-fifths clause. In a process akin to compound interest, the effects of this one little number would grow exponentially as time passed, giving the slave power far more than its fair share of federal House seats, state legislative and therefore federal Senate seats, and Electoral College seats, and therefore far more chances to dominate the presidency, the cabinet, and the court. If the long-term tendencies of this constitutional system were not evident to all in 1787, they surely were by 1804, when the document was amended in a manner that blessed its pro-slavery bias. See, without that three-fifths clause, John Adams actually beats Thomas Jefferson in the election of 1801, and everyone at the time knows that just as sure as everyone today talks about Florida, Ohio, or whatever. That this was not a fact that went unnoticed by the losers. What then happened to derail this train and to place the nation on a different track, heading in the opposite, not the freedom direction? In brief, Lincoln, secession, war, black arms bearing, and victory. Abraham Lincoln in 1858 knew two great truths. First, slavery was wrong. As he later put it, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Second, 
it would be well nigh impossible to right this wrong overnight, to abolish slavery immediately and everywhere. Sparring with Stephen Douglas in a series of celebrated debates across the length and breadth of Illinois, Lincoln at one point declared that if and when the nation ventured onto his own preferred path of long-term reform, quote, I do not suppose that in the most peaceful way ultimate extinction would occur in less than a hundred years at the least, unquote. The sluggish pace at which, a, 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 at which abolition had taken place even in the North justified Lincoln's cautious assessment. Although New York had passed a gradual emancipation statute in 1799, as of 1820, they still had over 10,000 bondsmen, ranking it alongside Missouri. In Connecticut, slavery had never been a particularly widespread practice. Nevertheless, it took more than half a century to uproot it. The state enacted its first gradual emancipation law in 1784, and it did not end all slavery until 1848. Similarly, New Jersey, which had begun the abolition, abolition process in 1804, did not put a decisive end to slavery until 1847, and a few blacks remained unfree until the Civil War. In many places, it seemed as if abolition meant ending slavery as a system more than freeing actual slaves then in bondage. Although Lincoln lost his 1858 bid to oust Douglas from the U.S. Senate, in 1860 the two men again squared off, this time with two other men in the ring and the presidency at stake. As before, Lincoln stood for long-term reform. Slavery's spread into virgin territory must stop immediately and absolutely, but in states where slavery had already insinuated itself, a different strategy was in order. Thus, the 1860 Republican Party platform seemed to forswear federal abolition in the states, pledging allegiance to, quote, the inviolate right of each state to order and control its own domestic institutions, and you know what that means, according to its own judgment exclusively, end quote. Republican Party platform of 1860 on which Mr. Lincoln stands and runs. How then would Lincoln's proposed bar on new uh, slave territory achieve his ultimate goal of general emancipation? In a word, gradually. Free territories would one day ripen into free states. Southeastern slavery would eventually be surrounded, aided perhaps by federal financial sweeteners. Upper South states such as Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri would eventually begin to adopt long-term systems of compensated emancipation, possibly accompanied by voluntary immigration of freedmen to Africa or Central America. Once slavery stopped growing and instead began to shrink, the state-led emancipation process might spread southward and accelerate a compound interest story in reverse, as local leaders began to devise smooth exit strategies. Winning, so that's, that's Lincoln's vision. Perhaps, though candidate Lincoln never said so, once anti-slavery leaders held sway over the vast majority of the nation, they might amend the federal constitution to provide for universal emancipation on a gradual and compensated basis. Winning just under 40% of the national vote in a four-man race Lincoln prevailed in 1860 by sweeping every free state save New Jersey, and thereby capturing 180 electoral votes compared to 123 electoral votes for the rest of the field. Even had all the popular votes count, uh, cast against Lincoln gone to a single anyone but Abe candidate, Lincoln would still have emerged victorious thanks to his outright majorities in northern states totaling 169 electoral votes. Still. For every two Lincoln men at the polls, three other men had voted against Lincoln. America's first openly anti-slavery president, he's the first openly anti-slavery president, could hardly claim a reigning mandate. Nor would Lincoln's new party be likely to overwhelm all others in Congress, having won only about 108 out of 237 House seats and controlling roughly 30 of the 66 Senate seats. All these facts and figures, I know I've been throwing a lot out to at you, all these facts and figures point to a sobering conclusion. Here's the punchline. Had the slave power, that is the slaveocrats, simply acquiesced in the election of 1860, nothing like immediate emancipation could ever have occurred in the 1860s. Had slaveocrats continued to play the game as they had been playing and generally winning it prior to 1860, they could have won or tied many more rounds in the short and intermediate run. Slavery would probably have continued for at least another half century, even had Lincoln and his new party managed to accomplish everything they realistically hoped for and more in his constitutionally guaranteed four years. But the slaveocrats did not acquiesce. 
Before Lincoln raised his right hand on March 4, 1861, seven states had already purported to secede and form their own confederacy. To woo the Deep South back into the Union and to deter the Upper South from joining the Confederacy, the lame duck Congress on March 2, 1861, voted by the requisite two-thirds of each house to propose a new amendment to the Constitution. This was the original 13th Amendment. Despite its clumsy grammar and customary euphemism, the proposal's thrust was plain enough. If, thanks to a strategy of containment and encirclement, anti-slavery forces were ever to command overwhelming national majorities, these forces would be barred from amending the Constitution to give Congress abolition power over slave states. This is the so-called Corwin Amendment. Several notable Republican congressmen voted for this measure, and Lincoln himself, in his inaugural address, pointedly mentioned it and expressed, quote, no objection, unquote. This is an amendment that basically says the federal government will never, the federal Constitution is never going to be amended to allow Congress to get rid of slavery in the states. And Lincoln says, no objection. Thus, the slave power's muscular grip on American politics was nowhere more evident than on March 4th, 1861. In what was then rightly seen as the most anti-slavery moment in American history, with the first inauguration ever of an openly anti-slavery president, that president, following the lead of his own anti-slavery party in Congress, blessed an amendment to make slavery in the states forever immune from congressional abolition. And then came a bombshell, quite literally. When Confederate forces began their military assault on Fort Sumter in early April, they sparked a process that brought about precisely what they sought to prevent, immediate, uncompensated, and universal abolition, something that could never have happened had they just held their fire. Rarely in history have cannons backfired so explosively. In response to Sumter's fall, Lincoln took immediate step steps to suppress the insurrection. I know over here there's this plaque that calls it the War of Southern Independence. The correct term is insurrection, rebellion, um, treason. Four Upper South states, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, thereupon entered the Confederacy, which now formed an 11-state bloc boycotting the Federal Congress. A handful of loyal congressmen from Confederate states nevertheless continued to serve in the Capitol, as did congressmen from the four, four slave states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, that remained in the Union. Alongside them were congressmen from the 19 free states. Ironically enough, it was secession itself that for the first time in history created a Congress dominated by anti-slavery statesmen. Because the slave Democrats had walked out the same way that the Soviet Union made a mistake when it walked out of the UN in the 1950s instead of wielding its veto pen uh, in the Korean conflict. At first, Lincoln and the Republicans proceeded cautiously on the anti-slavery front. The President's primary goal was to bring the South back into the Union with as little bloodshed as possible. Radical abolitionist measures early on would ruin any prospects for rapprochement. In its July special session, Congress endorsed a resolution co-sponsored by then-Senator Andrew Johnson defining Union war aims narrowly. Quote, this war is not waged for any purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights of established institutions of those states in revolt. You know what that means. But to defend and maintain the supremacy of the Constitution. So it's not a war about freedom. It's a war about union. Lincoln also had to guard his rear flank. Any quick move against slavery in 1861 might weaken his hold over the four loyal slave states, at least two of which were indispensable. Were Maryland to heed its secessionist elements and follow Virginia into the Confederacy, now, and remember that Lincoln in 1860 won less than 3% of Maryland's vote, popular vote, the District of Columbia would be surrounded and all but impossible to defend. Kentucky's position along the banks of the Ohio River also made it essential. Lincoln had won less than 1% of the vote in this, his birth state. Legend has it that Lincoln one, once quipped that, quote, I hope to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. As time passed, hopes of a quick victory and early reunion faded, while Lincoln's hold over the Middle States improved. In mid-April 1862, the first anniversary of Sumter, Republicans in Congress began to implement their modest anti-slavery agenda. First, Congress enacted a suggestive but vague joint resolution. Here's what it says in its entirety. The United States ought to, quote, the United States ought to cooperate with any state which may adopt gradual ab aboli uh, abolition of slavery, giving to such state pecuniary aid, financial aid, 
to be used by such state in its discretion to compensate for the inconveniences, public and private, produced by such change of system, unquote. So if states get rid of slavery on their own, the federal government will sweeten the pot. That same uh, week, Congress passed a detailed statute that freed all existing slaves in D.C., barred future slavery there, and authorized government compensation, $300 per slave, for loyal masters. Two months later, Congress banned slavery in all federal territory without any provision for compensation and in direct defiance of the Taney Court's pronouncements in Dred Scott, which said you can't have free soil in the territories. Yet this move was perhaps more modest than it looked. The act um, um, barred language verbatim from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which had been construed by the Washington administration only to bar the bringing of new slaves into the Northwest, not to free slaves already there. If the new act were similarly construed, or if the relatively few masters with slaves in the territories were to remove them quickly into a union slave state, then no issue of emancipation or compensation would arise. Um, also, a pair of federal confiscation acts in 1861 and 62 allowed federal officers to free certain slaves of individual rebels. In practice, however, these laws had rather limit, limited emancipatory effect. In September 1862, Lincoln proclaimed his own more expansive emancipation plan. This is the preliminary emancipation proclamation. In all places that continued to be under rebel control on New Year's Day, 1863, the Union government would cease to recognize the claims of masters, even loyalists. Slaves in these places would, if and when the Union army arrived, be liberated. On January 1, Lincoln finalized the proclamation, declaring that all slaves in rebel lands, some three million souls, to be, quote, forever free, unquote. With a stroke of the executive pen, Lincoln changed the meaning of the war in the course of American history. No longer was the struggle merely one to restore the Union as it was. Henceforth, it would be a war for freedom alongside Union. Lacking specific statutory warrant for his proclamation, one of the most sweeping measures ever undertaken in America, Lincoln pointed to his Article II power as America's commander-in-chief in a time of actual war. The war itself had destroyed um, a vast amount of liberty or, and property of innocent civilians as well as soldiers. Why should slave masters' property be regarded with extreme tenderness if such claims interfered with the Union's ability to win the war? And emancipation would, in Lincoln's eyes, surely help win the war by encouraging Southern slaves to come to the aid of the Union Army and also by preventing the English government from entering into any diplomatic alliance with the Confederacy. If the war were only about American Union, the English might well pursue their own imperial ambitions to divide and perhaps one day reconquer their former colonies. They might have come in and sided with the South. But once Lincoln's proclamation redefined the meaning of the war, linking union with freedom, anti-slavery British public opinion would prevent any unholy alliance between Great Britain and the Confederacy. Um, having taken the plunge toward abolition in various states, um, albeit states in rebellion, Lincoln strengthened his moral standing with a plan to extend abolition to the four loyal slave states. Um, and um, Lincoln's plan, so that, remember that's Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware. Uh, Lincoln's plan, unveiled in his December 1862 annual message to Congress, envisioned three new constitutional amendments. So his, his, his proposals, 13, 14, and 15. The first, would guarantee federal compensation to any slave state that abolished slavery prior to 1900. So Lincoln's earlier 100-year notion has now shrunk to 37 years. But even this was a far cry from the eventual reality of immediate, universal uh, emancipation in 1865. Lincoln's proposal should remind us that the ultimate 13th Amendment solution, freedom now, forever, and everywhere, was hardly foreordained even after the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln's additional constitutional proposals, his 14th and 15th Amendments, would have provided federal compensation for all loyal masters whose slaves had been liberated by the chances of war, and federal subsidies for any free colored persons willing to immigrate to Africa, Central America, or elsewhere. Now, to explain why the 13th through 15th Amendments that America in fact enacted from 1865 to 1870 differed so sharply from the 13th through 15th Amendments that Lincoln was dreaming of in late 1862, and also from the 13th Amendment that Lincoln attended with blessed in March 1861, the Corwin Amendment, we must turn away from the words of whites and attend to the deeds of blacks. <laughs> 
We must also venture beyond the elected leaders in D.C. to ponder the voters in the loyal states. Black Americans reacted to the proclamation by making it their own and taking freedom into their own hands. Emancipation would not merely be given by one white, but also earned by countless blacks. In the South, slaves fled plantations and flocked to the Union Army lines in droves, crippling the Confederate economy while pledging their allegiance to Lincoln. The proclamation had promised that slaves fleeing rebel soil would be received into the armed service of the United States, and thousands of such men poured into the Union ranks. Thrilled by the promise of freedom for their southern kinsmen, northern free blacks likewise rushed to volunteer in Lincoln's army. In Kentucky, more than half of the male slaves of fighting age signed up, spurred by federal promises of freedom for all such enlistees, and later promises of freedom for their families as well. All told, roughly 180,000 blacks served in blue, more than 20% of all African American males of military age. After blacks voted for Lincoln with their feet and arms, whites did so with their ballots. Without some good news from the battlefield, thanks in no small measure to blacks, Lincoln might well have lost his 1864 bid for re-election, and emancipation might have been stopped in his tracks or even rolled back. Had Democratic nominee George McClellan prevailed at the polls, might he have ended the emancipation process by allowing the Confederacy to take its remaining slaves and leave the Union? Might he have gone even further? What if, as America's new commander-in-chief, he tried to repeal his predecessor's proclamation as applied to any slave whose Confederate master sought to reclaim him? Lincoln's thumping victory with 212 electoral votes compared to McClellan's 21 made all such questions moot. Lincoln's allies also gained ground in congressional elections, with Republicans looking forward to controlling more than two-thirds of each house in the new 39th Congress. In his 1864 platform, you remember I told you what the 1860 platform was. Well, I'm not going to mess with Texas or with slavery in any of the states. In his 1864 platform, Lincoln's party pledged to amend the Constitution so as to effect, this is a quote, the utter and complete extirpation of slavery from the soil of the republic. And in the afterglow, that's an uh, unquote, and the afterglow of their November triumph, Republicans moved quickly to redeem this promise. Uh, in January 1865, the lame duck 38th Congress voted for a resoundingly abolitionist 13th Amendment, which received the support of two-thirds of the non-seceding true blue states in July and two-thirds of all the states, including the former Confederacy, in December. The speedy ratification process in the true blue states highlighted the link between Lincoln and, and, and this amendment. First to say yes was Lincoln's home state of Illinois, and the three states that had voted against Lincoln in 1864 New Jersey, Delaware, Kentucky, all declined to ratify. Now, the 13th Amendment marked a radical break with the antebellum federal constitution. The pre-war document has, had imposed few limits on what a state could do in its own, uh, to its own inhabitants, whereas that's the original constitution, whereas the 13th Amendment pulverized bedrock legal principles and practices in more than one-third of the states. The old Constitution had insulated property holders from uncompensated takings, but the new one ratified and extended the largest redistribution of property in American history. That's what abolition is. Slaves were worth more than any other capital asset, asset in the nation except land. In 1860, human chattel represented about three times as much wealth as the entire nation's manufacturing and rail stock. Yet the 13th Amendment made no provision for compensation even of loyal masters in true blue states like Missouri or, or Delaware. Section 4 of the 14th Amendment would go even further, prohibiting any federal or state compensation of slave masters. A structurally pro-slavery constitution became, in a flash, stunningly anti-slavery. The naked constitutional text misleads. Casual reader encounters the 13th Amendment whose words seem to flow smoothly after the first seven articles and the first 12 amendments in one continuous constitutional tradition linking the founders to their 21st century posterity. What the bare text does not show is the jagged gash between amendments 12 and 13, a gash reflecting the fact that the founders' constitution failed in 1861 to 65. The system almost died, and more than a half a million persons did die. Without these deaths, the 13th Amendment's new birth of freedom could never have occurred as it did. So that's my 13th Amendment story. Um, now, the 14th Amendment. 
who counted and who didn't and why in the adoption of the 13th and 14th Amendments, who opposed it and why. These are the questions close to the heart of my friend and colleague Bruce Ackerman's epic work in progress, We the People, Foundation Transformations Interpretations. As Ackerman tells the story, the Reconstruction Amendments emerge from a process akin to civil disobedience, with amenders thrusting aside the letter and spirit of Article 5. Though Ackerman ultimately proclaims the Reconstruction to be legitimate, he does so on the basis of his own ingenious theory of permissible constitutional change. This theory, which he mints more than a century after the events in question, repudiates much of what the Reconstruction Republicans claimed to be doing during the amendment process, namely complying with Article 5 as best they could in the uniquely tumultuous and utterly unprecedented circumstances created by the Civil War. So I'm first going to give you Ackerman's um, objections, then I'm going to tell you why I don't buy them. One, these are his arguments that the Reconstruction Amendments basically violated Article 5. One, in December 1865, the very month when the 13th Amendment came to be ratified, the Reconstruction Congress refused to seat House members and senators purporting to represent the defeated southern states. Yet all these states were in legal contemplation, part of an indivisible union. That was Lincoln's theory. Indeed, um, the ex-Confederate states were explicitly counted in tallying the ratifications to the 13th Amendment, which under the rules of Article 5 needed the approval of three quarters of the state legislatures. How, asks Ackerman, could ex-Confederate states both be in the Union for Article 5 purposes and out of it for Article 1 purposes? Here's the second objection. Congress continued to operate without widespread representation until mid-1868. In 1866, a rump Congress proposed the 14th Amendment by a two-thirds vote of each House, but that Article 5 hurdle would never have clear been cleared had the 80 excluded Southern members been present. The Senate, um, so that's a second objection. Third objection. In 1867, the Rump Congress enacted legislation purporting to outline the terms under which the defeated states would be readmitted into Congress. In effect, Congress conditioned each state's readmission on the state's prior ratification of the 14th Amendment. As with the 13th Amendment, this, counted, this process counted various states for Article 5 while excluding them from Article 1. And in fact, the process featured a double standard within Article 5 itself. If the Southern State Assemblies ratifying the 13th and 14th Amendments were valid legislatures for Article 5 purposes, how could the Federal Assembly excluding these states count as a proper Congress for Article 5 purposes? On this orthodox view, Reconstruction Republicans plausibly acted within the general Article 5 framework even as they repeatedly found themselves obliged to improvise, interpolate, and make commonsensical judgments to resolve many difficult legal issues that were arising for the first time in the mid-1860s and that have never recurred. Let's begin with the fact that when the 39th Congress met for the first time, December 4, 1865, both the House and Senate refused to seat members of the former rebel states. Now, even if these refusals plainly violated the Constitution, in fact, they didn't, but let's just bracket that, None of this would affect the illegality of the 13th Amendment because by then enough states have already ratified the 13th Amendment. So, um, uh, now thus far, by the way, um, uh, here's a parenthetical. Uh, I'm assuming that after Appomattox, all defeated states should be counted in both the ratifying state's numerator and the total state's denominator of Article 5. You count all the states. But you could instead um, uh, say the 13th Amendment would be valid if you instead treat the 11 state governments in the, formal, uh, uh, in the former Confederacy as having lapsed and thus not properly included in either numerator or denominator. On this view, there were only 25 true blue state governments that were constitutionally operative in 1865, and 19 would be needed to ratify Article 5, and long before the, the 39th Congress met, uh, uh, 19 true blue states had indeed ratified the abolition amendment. So whichever way we count, the 13th Amendment plainly clears the Article 5 bar. As for the 14th Amendment, the necessary 19 true blue states said yes as of mid-February 1867, end of parenthetical. I'll come back to that. Just bracket all that. For now, let's try to understand more precisely, as actually my friend Ackerman doesn't let his readers understand in my view, Let's try to understand more precisely why the House and Senate refused to seat representatives and senators purporting to speak for the defeated states. One problem was plain to see. 
the ex-Confederate elections had excluded all or virtually all blacks. That's the problem. Under the explicit language of Article 1, Section 5, each congressional house was made the judge of elections and returns of its members. If the state elections from the former Confederacy were constitutionally defective, then Congress had every right to refuse to seat the alleged victors. And if under the best or even a plausible reading of the Article 4 Republican Government Clause, no truly Republican state, circa 1865, had the right to disfranchise a quarter or more of its adult, free, male population, then the House and Senate could indeed properly find that the Southern elections were defective. Now, old guard critics attacked this sweeping conception of Article 4 as a violation of the Founders' vision. But much had happened in the nation's first 80 years to give rise to a more robustly egalitarian and nationalistic conception of Republican government than the one that had prevailed in the 1780s. For starters, the intervening decades had witnessed a dramatic expansion of suffrage rights, at least among white men. State law property qualifications, widespread at the founding, later sank into oblivion as universal free white male suffrage swept the land. By 1865, any state that automatically disfranchised a quarter or more of its free men, as did each ex-rebel state, was out of the American mainstream in a way that it would not have been in 1787. Long before 1865, Congress had accustomed itself to, joking, uh, to judging local republicanism by applying dynamic democratic standards in the course of admitting new western states. In the 1780s, a group of pre-existing states had combined to give birth to the federal government. Over the next 80 years, the federal government itself became a prolific parent, siring new states at a rapid rate. By the outset of the Civil War, nearly two-thirds of the states in the Union were there only because Congress had chosen to admit them after assuring itself that these states, once territories, met contemporary standards of republicanism. The process of admitting, st admitting states had also sharpened congressional sensibilities concerning el local electoral improprieties and had heightened congressional interest in local suffrage rules. These were the pulsating issues at the heart of the bleeding Kansas controversy in the late 1850s, a controversy in which local electoral misconduct had touched the national conscience and aroused the Republican Party. Um, um, and similar issues had arisen in actually a civil war in Rhode Island in the 1840s. Thus, both Rhode Island's civil war in the 1840s and Kansas's civil war in the 1850s helped frame Congress's understanding of its own broad powers to judge local republicanism in the aftermath of a far wider civil war in the 1860s. A long history of slaveocratic contempt for core republican freedoms formed yet another factor inclining re Reconstruction Republicans like Charles Sumner and John Bingham to a strongly nationalistic and democratic understanding of the Article IV Republican government guarantee. In the decades ramping up to the Civil War, the Deep South, that means you, the Deep South's paranoid obsession with protecting its peculiar institution, an institution coming under increasingly sharp criticism in the outside world, spurred countless acts of tyranny and intolerance. The result was an arc of Southern unfreedom spiraling outward. At the spiral center, slaves, of course, suffered brutal deprivations of life, liberty, and property. Then came serious repression of free blacks, whose very presence was feared to be a potential incitement to those in bondage. And then, increasingly, repression of whites themselves, both in the South and beyond. Several southern states made it a crime, in some places a capital offense, for a free white person to advocate abolition or to condemn slavery in strong language. Pulpits were silenced, presses confiscated, pamphlets burned, and abolitionist mail suppressed. In the grip of a mindset and political structure known by its critics as the slave power, southern politicians even tried to silence northerners. In the 1840s, slavocrats succeeded for a while in imposing gag rules that muzzled congressional free speech and debate over slavery. The slave power's assault on congressional free speech took even more graphic shape in 1856 when a South Carolina representative, Preston Brooks, bludgeoned Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner into bloody unconsciousness 
on the floor of the Senate in reprisal for Sumner's fiercely anti-slavery speech, The Crime Against Kansas. Brooks was hailed, that is applauded, in the South for his savage caning of an unarmed man. Um, though an overwhelming majority of northern congressmen voted to expel Brooks, every southerner save one voted to retain him, thereby causing the expulsion motion to fall short of the necessary two-thirds. Brooks received a second southern vote of confidence when he resigned mid-session, and his constituents returned him to Congress by a roaring margin that left no doubt about where they stood, that is, in favor of beating people into bloody unconsciousness because they had the audacity to say slavery was an evil thing. On the eve of the Civil War, North Carolina went so far as to demand that various northern congressmen and other northern political leaders be extradited to the Tar Heel State to face felony charges for having endorsed Hinton Helper's provocative anti-slavery tract, The Impending Crisis. By 1860, the slave power exemplified all the evils that the original Article IV guarantee of Republican government had aimed to avert. Aggressive slavocrats had flouted basic democratic freedoms within their own state, had menaced freedom lovers in neighboring states, and had begun to corrupt the character of federal institutions that rested on state law foundations, like Congress. A society that criminalized core political expression and that in effect outlawed the Republican Party was not merely unrepublican in a partisan sense, capital R Republican, but unrepublican in a generic sense. <clears throat> I had early told my readers, and I need to tell you, exactly how many popular votes Mr. Lincoln got in the election of 1860 south of Virginia. The answer is zero. Not electoral votes, popular votes. Zero popular votes south of Virginia. There were more people in Iraq who voted against Saddam Hussein than that. This was not a free society. It was uh, an intolerant society. And then came the most unrepublican act of all, secession itself. However distasteful Lincoln's triumph in 1860 may have been to some, his election was wholly lawful. As Lincoln himself explained on July 4, 1861, republicanism's foundational premise required the losers of a fair election to abide by its results. The root question, here's Mr. Lincoln, was, quote, whether a constitutional republic or a democracy a government of the people, by the same people, can or cannot maintain its territorial integrity. When discontented individuals, too few in numbers to control administration, according to organic law, can break up their government and thus practically put an end to free government upon the earth. When ballots have fairly and constitutionally decided, there can be no successful appeal back to bullets. There can be no successful appeal except to ballots themselves at succeeding elections. End quote. That's Mr. Lincoln. He was right. This, then, was the backdrop against which the 1865 House and Senate declined to readmit Southerners until Congress could confidently assure itself that the New South would abide by basic ground rules of Republican government as the Old South had not. A central plank of Reconstruction policy, as it eventually came to be hammered out in the 39th Congress, was that Southern governments would need to be braced based on a broad popular foundation that included free black voters alongside free whites. By voting in large numbers, Southern blacks would both embody the Republican idea of broad-based popular government and also prevent the revival of various unrepublican practices and tyrannical policies. Old Guard Democrats cried foul. The Southern elections in 1865 had generally followed the state election laws on the books in 1860. Since the Southern states in 1860 had been republics in good standing, eligible to be seated in Congress, Democrats argued that the new Southern states likewise deserved seats. Republicans countered that the act of secession itself and the unlawful war that the rebel states had waged against a duly elected Union government justified the Union's demands for new safeguards in rebel regions. Also. Republicans argued that by excluding slaves from the franchise in 1860 was one thing, but disfranchising free men in 1865, many of whom had in fact fought in the Union Army, was something altogether different. The old guard also accused congressional Republicans of hypocrisy. In 1865, only a handful of northern states allowed blacks to vote. If the South had to enfranchise its blacks, why didn't the North? The most persuasive response from leading Republican congressmen was that in the South, but not the North, 
blacks amounted to a large slice of the free population, while amounting, um, accounting for 2% or less of the total population in most northern states, free blacks constituted an outright majority in two southern states, South Carolina and Mississippi, almost half in four others, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, and more than a quarter in the remaining five ex-Confederate states, Virginia, North Carolina, Texas, Arkansas, and Tennessee. Northern voting restrictions, though illiberal and deeply regrettable to leading Reconstructionists, were not unrepublican because the vast majority of northern free males could, in fact, vote. Southern whites only rules by contrast, whites only rules by contrast, offended the basic republican idea of a government that derived its power from the great mass of the citizens. And now I'm going to give you some quotes that this is, to show you that this is actually their theory, because you won't find it in um, Professor Ackerman's book. As Sumner explained in an elaborate Senate speech in February 1866, the denial of justice to the colored citizens in Connecticut and New York is wrong and mean, but it is on so small a scale at, uh, that it is not perilous to the republic." Unquote. By contrast, southern states disfranchised a mighty mass, unquote, as Sumner proved by detailed recitation of the black and white population figures in southern states. This is a long quote from Sumner. Begin with Tennessee which disfranchises 283,079 citizens, being more than a quarter of its whole people, thus violating a distinctive principle of Republican government. But Tennessee is the least offensive on the list." Unquote. At the other end of the spectrum lay, quote, South Carolina, which disfranchises 412,408 citizens, being nearly two-thirds of its whole people. A republic is a pyramid standing on the broad mass of the people as a base. But here is a pyramid balanced on its point. To call such a re government Republican is a mockery of sense and decency. It is not difficult to classify these states. They are aristocracies or oligarchies." Unquote. Sumner added that had blacks been able to vote in 1860-61, quote, the acts of secession must have failed. Treason would have been voted down. Unquote. Um, Sumner had floated similar ideas on the first day of the 39th Congress, and analogous views would resound through the capital chambers over the ensuing months and years. I'm going to skip over lots and lots of quotes, but I could really bore you to tears with, with that. Okay. In response, Reconstruction Re in response to Reconstruction Republicans' quantitative arguments, some Northern Democrats played a quantitative card of their own, the gender card. If a republic required enfranchisement of the great mass of citizens, what about women? Most of these critics did not sincerely advocate women's suffrage, but used the issue to prick the pretensions of their adversaries. If the Republican government principle required black suffrage in the South, taunted one representative, then women should vote, this is a quote, then women should vote for the same reason. And the New England states themselves are only pretended republics because their women, who are a considerable majority, are denied the right of suffrage, unquote. So they'll see the race issue and raise you gender. Republicans had an army of counter arguments at their disposal. Women, as a rule, had not voted in the founding, nor did they vote in any state, north or south, east and west, in 1865. Thus, under either a sta static or dynamic approach to Republican government, the actual practice of American government let little support to the notion that the clause required women's suffrage. Instead, basic principles of Republican government would be met by broadly enfranchising men who could in turn be relied on to virtually represent the interest of the women in their lives, their mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters. By contrast, Southern whites could not be trusted to represent the interest of those whom they had so recently and ruthlessly enslaved. Within each state, the relatively even distribution of women across different districts also meant that male-only suffrage introduced no systematic skew into the process of state apportionment. Here, too, sex differed from race, because racially, if you count blacks or don't count blacks, you get great huge differences in apportionment maps, because they're not distributed equally. They're clumped in various plantation belts. Moreover, certain political responsibilities properly accompanied the possession, pl political responsibilities properly accompanied the possession of political rights. Free men, black and white, had in the past and could in the future be obliged to bear arms for the common defense. Women, by contrast, did not bear arms in the military and thus had a lesser claim on the franchise. So, sort of Second Amendment-like ideas about arms bearing and its link to who counts as the people and not the people for voting purposes. Um, uh, now, um, 
it remains to consider, uh, 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 let me just um, uh, talk about one other issue and then I'm going to quickly talk about the 15th Amendment and then close. Um, um, now, because uh, one of the things Ackerman says, remember, is why are you basically forcing the southern states to ratify this amendment as a condition of their, you're not just keeping them out, but you're saying we'll let you back in if you ratify the 14th Amendment. Isn't that, in modern parlance, an unconstitutional condition? Had Congress tried, and here's my answer, had Congress tried to extort Southern ratification of a proposed amendment wholly unrelated to Southern and Republicanism, we might then indeed properly wonder whether Congress had abused its powers. Imagine, say, that Congress demanded the Southern states agree to a, a tariff amendment aimed at benefiting Northern mercantile interests. But in fact, the ratification conditions that Congress imposed were highly germane to the problem at hand. That's the key word in responding to an unconstitutional conditions argument namely Southern and Republicanism, precisely because the amendment itself revolved in tight orbit around core principles of Republican government. For example, the 14th Amendment's opening section served to prote protect fundamental privileges and immunities, especially freedoms of speech, press, petition, and assembly against future state abridgment. This section served to codify the, some of the specifics of Republican government. Uh, offering a more detailed recipe for future state compliance with American-style republicanism. State compliance with these safeguards would help prevent future acts of unrepublicanism, ranging from censorship to armed insurrection. Also, the amendment section two restructured congressional apportionment so as to induce states to practice a maximally inclusive republicanism, at least among men. Each and every state disfranchisement of a free male citizen would reduce a state's clout in Congress. In the book I, in the, in the, from which this is derived, I talk about some of the parts of, of, of the 14th Amendment that deal with a congressional apportionment, and I've sort of omitted that today. Finally, the very willingness of a given ex-Confederate state to ratify the amendment would itself credibly signal that the state had rejoined the Republican ranks and sincerely renounced its early offenses against the Republican ideal, including secession itself. Such a credible commitment was necessary to prove Southern good faith to a justifiably skeptical nation. Suspicion of the South's good faith ran especially high in the mid-1860s because a large percentage of Southern leaders had in fact treasonably betrayed their antebellum oaths to uphold the federal constitution. In the first round of post-bellum congressional elections, the supposedly new South had tried to send to the Capitol many of its old oath-breaking leaders and other prominent secessionists. Four Confederate generals, four colonels, several Confederate congressmen and members of Confederate state legislatures, and even the vice presidency of the Confederacy, Alexander H. Stevens. Troubling reports also began to pour into Congress concerning a host of abusive Southern actions, all too reminiscent of the pre-war slaveocracy's misconduct. Terrorism against blacks, violence targeted at white unionists, voting fraud, and new laws, the black codes, aimed at reducing freedmen to virtual peonage. So I'm going to stop my 14th Amendment narrative. Just one little asterisk or footnote. Um, Alexander Stevens has a particular connection to the University of Georgia. He's one of the more prominent alums of this institution. Um, so I'm picking this partly because y'all are very interested in history, and this is the history, it seems to me, that, that bears on our common constitution. Let me briefly tell you how you get the 15th Amendment, because it's actually a rather interesting story um, for the reason that I'm about to tell you. The 15th Amendment, remember, is about black suffrage. In the congressional election of 1860, Race-blind suffrage rules prevailed in only five states, comprising less than one-half of one percent of the nation's blacks. In the congressional election of 1870, just ten years later, thanks to the newly ratified 15th Amendment, equal suffrage was the supreme law of the land, binding in every state and all elections, local, state, and federal. How could such a sea change occur? How could a rule that Republican leaders themselves saw as politically suicidal in mid-1866 when the ascent of three-quarters of the states in early 1870, because the 14th Amendment is, does not promise black suffrage. And all the Republicans say it's not about black suffrage because this is politically a total loser in 1866. So what happens in three short years? Um, the story of black ballots begins with black bullets. At war's end, it began to sink in that blacks in blue had helped save the Union. 
in March 1864, Lincoln was confidently moving toward the notion, remember, Lincoln ha has come a long way. Uh, in, in, in March of 1864, he's moving toward the notion that the reconstructed Southern government should enfranchise some blacks, in particular, quote, the very intelligent and especially those who have fought gallantly in our ranks, unquote. In another private letter, Lincoln declared, him, uh, declared himself clear and decided that blacks, quote, who have so heroically vindicated their manhood on the battlefield have demonstrated in blood their right to the ballot, which is but the humane protection of the flag they have so fearlessly defended. So Second Amendment-like ideas. You bear arms for your country, you're entitled to, to vote and be part of the people. Um, in a speech delivered four days before his death, formal remarks that agree, the grieving Americans soon came to realize were his last words to them. Lincoln went public with his new vision. Here's what he told America in his last speech to us. Quote, it is unsatisfactory to some that the electoral franchise is not given to the colored man. I would myself prefer that it were now conferred on the very intelligent and on those who serve our cause as soldiers, unquote. On the first day of the 39th Congress, Charles Sumner took the position that no ex-Confederate state can be accepted as Republican, this is a quote, where large masses of citizens who have always been loyal to the United States are excluded from the electoral franchise, you've heard about that, and especially where the wounded soldier of the Union, with all his kindred and race, and also the kindred of others whose bones whiten the battlefields where they died for their country, are thrust away from the polls, unquote. Sumner here played the soldier card, both played the soldier card and upped the ante, openly urging uh, not just ballot access for the black soldier, but for all black men. While focusing particular attention on southern disfranchisements, he also let it be known that he favored black suffrage in the north as well. Sumner's colleagues, however, were not yet prepared to follow his lead. The, pa the path from Sumter's fall to Sumner's rise was rather roundabout. In the end, black bullets won black ballots only indirectly via a political ricochet. First, in 1866 to 68, northern white Republicans imposed black suffrage on the former Confederacy while exempting their own states. I began to tell you that story. Then, in 1869 to 70, northern white Republicans eventually linked arms with new southern black voters and black lawmakers to reform the North and also cement voting rights in the South. We're getting close to the end. December 7, 1868 is a date that should live in glory. For the first time ever, a session of Congress, in this case the third session of the 40th Congress, began with a membership that had been obliged to come before various electorates and state legislatures encompassing large numbers of blacks alongside whites. Although many northern states continued to exclude black voters, the great majority of ex-Confederate states had finally rejoined Congress thanks to their enactments of new constitutions based on equal suffrage and their ratification of the 14th Amendment, which was proclaimed valid in late July 1868. These readmissions left only a three unreconstructed holdouts, Virginia, Texas, and Mississippi, outside the congressional fold. Much as they had cause to celebrate in December 1868, Republicans also had grounds for concern. True, the party had just won substantial victories in the November congressional races and could also look forward to the departure of Andrew Johnson in favor of General Ulysses Grant. Yet the general had only won 300,000 more popular votes than his Democratic rival, Horatio Seymour. Since, blacks, uh, since roughly half a million blacks had voted, it appeared that most whites had actually backed the Democratic presidential ticket. If, however, another constitutional amendment could require northern and middle states to extend the franchise to blacks, this infusion of new voters might give Republicans extra electoral security in the coming years. Also, by federalizing an equal suffrage right that was then only a feature of state constitutions, arguably subject to unilateral state repeal, a new amendment could guarantee against the risk of future southern backsliding. But why, we might ask, was the political climate in 1868 to 69 any more conducive to an equal suffrage amendment than in 1866, when Republicans had carefully considered and rejected this option? For starters, Northern Republican crusaders in Congress could now join forces with new Southern Republicans, who themselves had to answer to multiracial constituencies. Also, the 15th Amendment would be conceived at a different stage of the electoral cycle than had the 14th. 
In the spring of 1866, Republicans in the first session of the 39th Congress knew that they had to come before the voters very soon, and thus crafted the 14th Amendment as the party's unofficial campaign platform. Since northern white voters were not ready for a national mandate of political rights for blacks, Republicans promised only civil rights, not political rights. But in the winter of 1869, members of the third lame duck session of the 40th Congress had less to fear from potentially hostile voters, whom they would not need to face immediately. With any luck, by the time new elections rolled around, the 15th Amendment would itself be the law of the land. If so, any lost white votes might be offset by grateful black votes. Republican congressmen in 1869 were thus freer than they had been in 1866 to vote their conscience with impunity. Now, to be clear, they're doing this not to gain votes. They think it's the right thing to do. They just think in 1866 it's the right thing to do that's politically suicidal, and in 1869 it's the right thing to do that's politically possible. Reformers had also won back the presidency between 1866 and 69. Though Article 5 gives no formal role to the president, Andrew Johnson had wielded all his powers of patronage and persuasion to assail the reformist platform in 1866. Even after congressional reformers won a resounding vote of confidence from their northern constituents in the midterm election of that year, Johnson himself, who was of course not on the 1866 ballot, remained in office as a stubborn, and I do mean stubborn, reality to be reckoned with. In 1869, however, Republicans were united under Grant, and reformers could make their case with no fear that the president would use his pulpit to foment white bigotry against them. In fact, the new president used his inaugural address to, quote, entertain the hope and desire, unquote, that the 15th Amendment would be promptly ratified. Meanwhile, some white voters seemed to be warming to the idea of black suffrage. Though the idea had lost in all six states that put the issue to a vote between 1865 and 67, it won in two states in 1868, one of which, Minnesota, had twice rejected the reform in prior votes. In any event, the 15th Amendment would not come directly before the voters, but rather before Republican-dominated state legislatures, whose members were more apt to toe the party line and who were themselves likely to benefit from the grateful votes of the newly enfranchised blacks in future elections. So bottom line, when it comes to extending the vote, the less democratic process of, of the legislature actually is more likely to achieve the more democratic result. Voters are less likely to share the vote with other voters than legislators are, interestingly enough. Same thing's going to happen with women's suffrage 50 years later. Horizontal and vertical federalism issues also interacted in different ways in the mid and late 1860s. Early on, the issue was whether a given northern state should unilaterally enfranchise its blacks. Some who believed in the abstract idea of equality might nevertheless have voted no, lest the new rule induce a massive influx of new blacks into the state. This is the welfare magnet problem. But in 1869 to 70, the issue was whether all states should collectively enfranchise blacks. In this contrast, context, no state had reason to f fear becoming a magnet. A state that ratified the 15th Amendment did not thereby commit itself to equal suffrage unless and until all its neighbors would likewise be bound. In the end, every northern state that said no to equal suffrage in 1865 to 67 said yes to the 15th Amendment in 1869 to 70. By its terms, the amendment did not mandate universal manhood suffrage. It merely prohibited race-based disfranchisements. In later decades, this narrow draftsmanship would prompt countless shams and subterfuges, whereby various states, actually including this one, especially ex-Confederate states, would use formally neutral rules, such as literacy tests and poll taxes, to exclude blacks from the ballot. In theory, such disfranchisement should have triggered apportionment penalties under Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, but this section was never enforced. Robust and sustained enforcement of black voting rights came only in the second reconstruction of the 1960s, when Congress used its sweeping enforcement powers under the 15th Amendment's sec second section to enact appropriate legislation targeting state abuses. And here's my last thought. Here was yet another ricochet, an amendment that had been propelled forward by black voters in the South ultimately succeeded in revolutionizing black voting in the North, which in turn eventually brought the South back into line. So after all the division between Connecticut and Georgia, South and North, um, 
we'd all come together um, with, the, with the second reconstruction, uh, which is, the, I think, the lesson that I want to leave you with today, and a, and a message that I very much see around this campus when I look at all the plaques and, uh, and see not just the history of the 1860s, but um, the early 1860s, but the 1960s as well, and later uh, 1990s uh, celebrated on this campus. Thank you very much. Thank you.